Hello, I'm Somi Aryan. I'm the founder of Empik, a women-led inclusive platform where visionary individuals come to gain live access to global leaders and learn about cutting-edge topics in macroeconomics, Web3, and next-gen health and wellness. My guest on today's podcast is Rebecca Crothmer, a technology ethicist, Forbes 30 under 30, and founder and chief product officer of QSecure a company that protects public key cryptography from the threat of quantum computing. I'm fascinated by quantum physics and quantum computing. As someone who is also very interested in crypto technology, I'm also concerned about the impact of quantum computing on the future of digital assets. So this was a great opportunity for me to ask all of my burning questions. Let's go with uh, just a a little introduction first, you know, um, talk a little bit about who you are and how you got into uh, your your journey into tech. Were you always a genius? <laughs> <Duh>. <laughs> oh man, genius is very, very much a stretch. Uh, but I, um, I started out, well, when I was little, I really wanted to be a doctor because I, um, I traveled a lot with my family when I was little and I was super lucky to be able to do that. And uh, <clears throat> I wanted to be a doctor because I wanted to be able to, it was kind of like the, the help people type of job. Uh, and then I got into college and I took chemistry and I was like, oh no, I don't think I can do this. <laughs> chemistry is really hard. Um, and then kind of through, you know, a number of different, um, different events, uh, I kind of realized that entrepreneurship and, and technology gives you so many options to be able to, to, shape your career. Um, whereas, you know, when I was thinking about being a doctor for the rest of my life, my, uh, you know, I'm a little ADD that kind of sounded, uh, like I might not be able to just do one thing for forever, but whereas entrepreneurship and, and having a technology background, you really get to, um, you get to have a lot more agency and choice and you can, you can do what you want. So, uh, not sure I knew all of that when I jumped in, but, uh, so I, you know, I was at Stanford and I picked up, a uh, a, you know, kind of AI related major and got really interested in just the big ideas around AI and you know, what, what does it mean to, to be a thinking thing? What does it mean to build a thinking thing? And it, I, I went into to big consulting, got a lot of different experiences in different types of companies and then um, decided that I didn't want to do that either and, and took a, a year off and traveled around the world and more and more got into this, uh, this area of ethical technology and how do we move forward and, and build ethical technology when it's so, um, you know, we have, we have phones and computers and they're just attached to us now. How do we make sure that these are things that then enhance our lives and our, uh, our ability to, to, to be human and connect. So, uh, you know, I started, freelancing more and more in AI to get more of a background in it and started to, to deal in different um, ethics groups. And ultimately, uh, kind of long story short, my now co-founders brought me into the idea of quantum computing. And at this point, I, I had built enough, uh, you know, hands-on built enough in AI to understand where, uh, where our limitations lie, especially in terms of, you know, training big models and, and doing things with the hardware we have today. So quantum computing came onto my radar and it was like, oh, I have to do this. This is, you know, it became the very clearly the next step on, uh, in, in computing for me. So, uh, we started quantum thought and quantum thought is a venture studio that, uh, it's really kind of like a startup of startups. Uh, so you fund ideas in the quantum computing space and, uh, it's been a really fun road. The major company that came out of that has been QSecure, which I now kind of spend most of my time on as the, the co-founder and chief product officer. And that is this application within quantum computing where quantum computers are on the horizon. They're, you know, they're actually being built right now. They're real, uh, but they're very early. It's kind of like we're in the 1960s of computers. The, that's the equivalent in the quantum computing space. So uh, very exciting in a number of, of areas and one kind of not so uh, exciting application of quantum computers is that they're set to break all of our cryptography and essentially all of our cybersecurity that we hold dear that, that protects our data. 
So what we do at QSecure is we build software that protects data networks and data infrastructure from, uh, from those type of attacks, as well as other sort of breaches that, um, that are taking place right now. So it's a really exciting place to be. And, yeah. um, you know, I get to, I get to work with what I love and, uh, yeah, that's, that's my, my windy road of how I ended up here. That's fascinating. I have so many questions, man. I was like <laughs> listening to that thinking, so, uh, where do I even begin? Because, you know, I've been super interested in quantum physics for a very long time as like, you know, obviously in, uh, I, I haven't studied physics, right. But, you know, from the viewpoint of lay person reading, you know, a popular science and, and trying to understand it. And it's so right. fascinating. So, so tell me a little bit about, do you think that in our lifetime, we are going to see a full fledged quantum computer? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I would say I'm, I'm fully convinced, uh, I think it'll probably be more in the next, next decade. Uh, so whereas we're in the, you know, the 1960s of quantum computing, we have tools that they didn't have at the time to advance and, and uh, bring these things online faster and better than we did then. So for example, we have machine learning to understand what is going right and what we could do better. Um, we have a bunch of technology to help us build this stuff. And it's it's a huge technology problem and it's a huge kind of science challenge to, to do this, um, which is a whole other cool part of this, right? It's it's deep science uh, and it's being brought to the mainstream and, and these basically this really, really cool science project is being funded and supported. And, uh, but yeah, I think that the, the acceleration that's taking place with quantum computers and quantum computing development is incredible. Uh, several years ago, you know, we we it was more kind of theoretical, and we'd had single-ish qubits devices. Uh, and a qubit is, you know, for for anyone who's not familiar with it, it's kind of like the it's analogous to the computing bit. Uh, so our computers work on ones and zeros, and the qubit is is that sort of equivalent for a quantum computer, but it it uses weird quantum physics to be able to um, hold different logic states at once. So you can do different things with a quantum computer, uh, like solve massively variable intensive problems that you can't on regular computers because they don't scale like quantum computers do. And That's so, it, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so we, essentially, sorry to interrupt. So let me try and see if I understand that because essentially in quantum physics, what makes it really unique is that we are saying that two things could happen at the same time, right? That one mm -hmm. thing could be in more than one state at the same time, right? right. And right. and in linear physics and linear computing, things happen one at a time. So what quantum uh, computing does is that it's able to hold more than one logic at a time. So so it's not like if this then that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that that's precisely it. If this, then that, if this, then that. So it's it's this linear kind of always. So it multitasks over. is like a true meaning of multitasking. It's kind of the true meaning of multitasking. Yeah. So I can um, here, I'll, I'll give you my little 30 second, my favorite way of explaining how a quantum computer thinks. Yeah. And so if think about a maze. Right, you're, you're, you're a human trying to go in and solve a maze and you enter into the maze and you hit your first T or you go right or left. Uh, so, you know, go right or go left. So I go right, I hit my next T, I have to go right or left. And it's this iterative process of, of taking wrong turns and right turns and ultimately finding your way through this maze. And that's how a regular computer works in some ways too. Uh, where a quantum computer, you go into this maze and you're a quantum computer, you hit your first T and you go right and left at the same time, not in parallel, but actually, you know, as though these two things were simultaneously true. And then you hit your next T again, you know, these, all, all these things can be true at once. Uh, <clears throat> and again, and again, and again, so you can simultaneously look at all these paths through the maze. And then again, with the weirdness of quantum physics, all these things are true until you measure it. Uh, until you kind of cut it down. And this is where the quantum algorithm comes into play. The quantum algorithm will sort of prune off the wrong paths in a, in a clever way. And then, boom, it's collapsed into the most optimal state 
or sorry, the most optimal path to get through the maze. So that's exactly right. You can look at all of these, you can hold all these ambiguities and all these different things in uh, simultaneously at once in a way that we, um, you know, in, in the logical kind of binary realm, we, we can't, we can't do that. So is that the decoherence when mm. the, when the thing collapses into one reality, is that what it called, what, what they call decoherence? Ah, so almost the, the decoherence part is, um, well, the decoherence is typically something that we're trying to fight against. And that's one of the reasons like we are, um, one of the challenges to building a big quantum computer is that typically qubits are, are little particles and they're pretty sensitive. And so they can hold these states and it, it's a challenge to get them to hold these states properly. So sometimes they decohere, they sort of start falling apart. And so that's why we don't right now, one of the reasons we don't right now have a, uh, a huge scale quantum computer that can do really, really awesome stuff um, is that's one of the pieces that the, the thing that we're doing when we, we collapse it down, that's the measurement piece of it. So, um, you know, if you've ever heard of like Schrodinger's cat, uh, <laughs> yes, that's what I, exactly what I was thinking of, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So when the, the box is closed, the cat's dead and alive at the same time. And when you open the box, that's what you're doing with the collapsing. You're you're observing it. You're um, you're making it choose a state, so to speak. Um, yeah. And that sounds really kind of ambiguous, maybe, but it's this uh, it's it's the weird rules of the the quantum realm where some. It, once you try to measure it, once you try to to lock in an answer, then it uh, then it it does, and you just got to be clever about how you lock in that answer from a, I guess, mathematical perspective, really. Yeah, no, super fascinating. So, the way that I came across you was because of my interest in blockchain, and I was looking at you know various companies that are working in this area. So I can see now how your work is going to be relevant to let's say the blockchain space you know i know that the, one of the things that people are worried about is, about bitcoin for example is quantum computing right mm -hmm. uh, so we can talk a little bit about that but but honestly what you're doing is so interesting it's like way beyond uh you know the interest in money or, or crypto um things like that uh you know i always have this this image when I'm trying to kind of understand what life is, right? That is like these bubbles of prob probability. And mm. then, and then, uh, you know, with every action that we take, one of those bubbles, you know, burst, you know, kind of like the, uh, one of the, the collapsing of what you're, you're talking about. Like, that's what life back. is, right? Like that we are, we are constantly in these states of, um, you know, possibility or probability. And then, and then with every cho choice that we make, so many different op opportunities are possible and maybe maybe yeah. in another another parallel universe you know uh, my parallel so me is taking another path <laughs> yeah no that's beautiful yeah so like so that. so going back to the cryptography uh issue so so tell me are quantum computers um a real threat to uh you know the cryptocurrency uh, and what what are being done uh, to mitigate them? Yeah, so um, the answer is is yes, and kind of in the form that they're in right now. So we have quantum computers that are you have got about a hundred ish qubits. The the place that we need to get to for quantum computers to be be able to break through um, something like like RSA, which is not you know, not exactly blockchain, but uh, that's around 4,000 error corrected qubits, um, which actually means quite a bit more than 4,000 because you need a number of qubits per, a number of what they call physical qubits per logical qubit. And so, um, so we need to scale up to many, many thousands of qubits to get to that place where it's, it's just done breaking. And, and in theory, once we get to this place, yes, blockchain, um, is definitely, at risk of being cracked by by a quantum computer, if not sort of in a in a place where it's definitely going to be cracked by that quantum computer. So what we can do though is there's new algorithms that are being put out by the um, the, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, 
Uh, and those algorithms are sort of a new type of math that, uh, and it's not quantum math, it's, it's really just like classical math that's a little different from the algorithms that we use today to encrypt things. And so what we're, and what we work on is, is incorporating those into systems and software to, um, so th those mathematical algorithms, encryption algorithms are safe against today's computers and quantum computers. So you can overlay existing structures with um, the help of those algorithms to protect against quantum attacks. And kind of the cool thing is that they don't, you don't need a quantum computer to be able to implement these protection algorithms. You can do it before that big quantum computer comes online. And uh, the reason you might wanna do that is because there's this idea of store now decrypt later, where say you are a financial institution, uh, you know, you're, you're a bank and you have sensitive information, bank account numbers, social security numbers, you have all this stuff that you don't wanna get out now or in five years from now, or probably in 10 years from now. And so um, if a hacker or a bad actor kind of is able to harvest a database, an encrypted database or data source, they um, this store now decrypt later strategy is I'll take this and then I'll wait until I have the power to, to decrypt it. And then I'll you know, leak this data or do whatever I want with it. Uh, so that's kind of the, the situation that we sit in now with quantum computers is they're very much proven to be able to break things like what we're talking about. And if data is intercepted in some way, even though it's encrypted now, it's it will be decrypted at a certain point in time when that quantum computer comes online. So long story short, it needs to be protected now to prevent it, prevent that from happening. So if it is harvested in the near future, then uh, then that data won't be leaked, if that makes sense. Yeah. So are you aware of let's say something like Bitcoin, whether these types of measures have been mm -hmm. um, put in place? So, well, so for the most part, they have not yet. And we're working, we're actually working with a large financial institution. They have a, um, they have the, a crypto fund. Mm -hmm. And so we're actually working with them to secure some of the, the activities and things that happen around that. Um, we are working with another blockchain company to, again, add this extra layer of security for them. And <clears throat> one thing that's interesting is that, so I, I do know that a number of blockchain or cryptocurrency initiatives have started to talk about making their, their systems post, what, what they call post quantum secure, which is really that pre quantum security, but you know, the, the industry calls it post quantum, uh, one thing that did just happen this past week is that in, in the US, um, President Biden signed an executive order making it, uh, making it a mandate that government agencies over the next, I think, six months, they start they come up with a plan to migrate all their data systems to quantum secure data systems. So uh, some of those will probably include blockchain technologies um, or data that's that's shared in that way. Uh, typically, it's probably more classical databases, but there is a, there is a lot of talk, and we at QSecure are doing a good amount in the blockchain space. And uh, it's it's sort of a inevitable that that a lot of these infrastructures will have to make this upgrade pretty soon. I wonder what will happen with something like Bitcoin in particular, because it doesn't have like, like the person Satoshi is, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. like disappeared. Um, right. so, so I wonder who is going to, here. who is going to implement that on, on that. And, and uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on, on that? So, okay. With something like, Ethereum, Cardano, Solana, all these other things, you know, they have people who are working there like company, they're essentially tech companies. Whereas mm -hmm. with Bitcoin, nobody owns it technically. Right. That's a great question. <laughs> I, I don't know. Cause um, I mean, a lot of the work that we're doing is with organizations and, and companies that have some centralized control over it. So that's, that's a really great question. Um, okay. Super interesting. So um, from a biotech perspective, mm -hmm. where do you see quantum computing coming uh, into play? Uh, do you oh. feel like it's, I, I, I can imagine it having so many, you know, implications. Like say, let's say, you know, if you could put quantum computing together with genomics and essentially yeah. 
work out all of the different scenarios of you know what an embryo could end up in yeah right and you could gene edit oh my god this is so fascinating i really want to see that in my lifetime this is so i know it's like it's like gattaca right um (laughs) it's it's i mean it's it's super interesting so obviously from i did a little bit of work um with the awesome world economic forum on putting out some governance principles around quantum computing development and one thing that um kind of the piece that that i worked most closely with was privacy and so obviously from the privacy standpoint, when it comes to something like genomic data, um, so, so many of us or our close relatives have had 23andMe or uh, you know, a genetic tests, and so our data is out there. So something that's really important when we think about privacy in a world where quantum, quantum is coming online or computers themselves are getting more and more powerful, we need to protect that privacy. And it's on the, on the face of it, the, the cybersecurity piece is huge but also the ability of quantum computers to make these correlations and um, kind of pull out data and inferences that we might not be aware of right now that that could be made, but in the future, we could be in this place where you can look at someone's genome and you can really just pull out all these these interesting patterns and make sense of them in a way that we can't today. Uh, And that is both really exciting and we've got to sort of be on the lookout and make sure that, that people are protected. Uh, with a with a forward looking mindset, right? Because we don't know what we can do today, and you know one of the one of the interesting things in the quantum computing space is uh, because the fundamental piece of logic, uh, the fundamental way a computer quantum computer thinks, is very different from the way that a classical computer thinks. Uh, all of the algorithms need to be rewritten or re um, not even just rewritten but invented. So there's uh, there's a lot of work going on in that space to come up with these new ways that we can use quantum computers. So some things we know, like Shor's algorithm for a quantum computer to break uh, RSA or public key cryptography, and then other algorithms that will will arise in just this space are still being invented. So we don't know what we don't know, but it's very exciting. I personally think that there's a lot of promise in quantum computing to make these correlations, to be able to look at genomes and maybe, you know, perform really advanced diagnostics or genetic sequencing in a in a really intelligent way that we can't do now. Another piece of this uh, of the quantum space that is very, very interesting is uh, quantum computers as simulators for uh, for natural processes. So um, what they call kind of chemistry simulation. And it's <clears throat> when you think of something like drug development, there's years and years and years that go into research and development for, for a given drug because you have to experiment um, with how certain compounds and chemicals work together. And you actually have to trial and error it because in large part, it's so complicated to model the, the energy states and interactions of molecules and, and uh, things at the atomic level. Uh, because of the complexity, regular computers can't really handle handle that. Quantum computers show the promise of being able to do that. So they could model these chemical interactions, these molecular interactions in a way that could uh, help us come up with things like um, personalized medicine, or you know, we could potentially look at a genome and, and come up with, uh, and this is very far future, we need a pretty powerful quantum computer for this, but it's pretty exciting to think about using a quantum computer to be able to do things like synthesize new materials and, and potentially uh, uh, drugs that could be, um, one, cut, cut R&D time down a lot, and two, be uh, much more accurate and uh, very interesting. Super interesting. Yeah. Can I ask you, uh, Rekha, do you have kids? I do not, no. Do you, do you think you will have kids? <laughs> Considering, like, I, like, honestly, I've decided not to have kids, mm. children, yeah. partly because of the uncertainty of human humanity. Like, I'm so, the world right like, now, yeah. this is so fascinating, right? Like, I'm, like, I'm like, bring it on. This is so interesting, but <laughs> it is scary as well, right? Like, and, and I think, yeah. like, I would feel really responsible bringing a child into this world because this is so scary at the same time as being really fascinating, you know? And I'm like, I feel like I- I'm happy for the journey. Like, I'm, like, bring it on. Let's go. Let's do this. But imagine, like, in a world where 
you could use quantum computing to discover all of the different outcomes of you know that that's the what the simulation is right mm -hmm. it's yeah i mean that is why i'm so interested in the ethical side of things because mm -hmm. you know I, I really think it's it's easy to get into this place of um things could get really bad right you know that's what all, all sci-fi novels and movies are based on we took technology to this place where you know there's there's no coming back from it um and i think you know if, if i'd want people listening today to come away with one thing it's it's stay passionate about the ethics we can shape it and you know one thing i talk about a lot is uh we need to bring more women and exactly you know a an extended diversity um, into into building these things and into to making decisions around how they're built. So, you know, one thing I'd really love to see in the quantum computing space is uh, being in Silicon Valley. There's there is an imbalance um, in women and you know people of color and gender diverse and and all this uh, in this space. And of course, if people are if a, a certain group primarily is building a thing, it's probably going to represent that that group of people. So. Um, I want to see more, more women, um, and others get into this space to be able to shape it. Uh, so it does represent us. It does represent everybody. And it, it, I think that's one of the key parts of how to, how to think about building this stuff ethically is we have a responsibility for it. And, the only uh, problem is the bloody math. <laughs> well, I'll tell you a secret. I, I am horrible with the math. No, um, really terrible. No, and I'm not just saying that. <laughs> and it's always been a big insecurity for me. But uh, I decided at a certain point to not let it, um, not let it hold me oh, back yeah. and kind of <laughs> lean into the other stuff. So um, I love math. It's just <laughs> that I love it. But I would need to do nothing else and just do that to be able <laughs> because I have ADHD. It's so hard for me to concentrate on it. <laughs> I like, get that. Yeah, it's so true. hard. Like I would need to like give up life to just do math. I need to, I'm, you know, because I, I was teaching myself linear algebra to teach myself Python. And I, I kind of taught myself some um, very basic Python just to the point that I like now I'm kind of teaching myself very uh you know at the moment I'm like dabbling into blockchain and learning and it's like it's just not not because I'm going to do any kind of coding not because I'm going to like you know I'm not a coder you know I'm, I'm building a business I don't I'm already working 14 15 hours a day but it's just that when I'm hiring people I want to be able to speak their language you know same mm -hmm. in a similar way yeah. as a filmmaker I, um you know and as a producer director I actually taught myself everything to do with the technical aspects of you know uh film filmmaking you know all of the tech okay. like when, so that when i'm talking to a cameraman or a woman you know i can talk uh i can talk about all of the technical so i can talk about the aperture and the iso and this and that right and mm -hmm. and i can talk about the color grading you know how this is going to look like so i think it's important to learn those technical stuff but um there are, there are some things that are going to take a lifetime to get good at. And I think, yeah. you know, like uh, I, I, I have a very good conceptual understanding of artificial intelligence and quantum computing and, you know, all these things so that when I'm interviewing somebody like you, I can ask the right questions. Mm. Uh, uh, but, you know, it's, it's another, another level to try and get women into it to the point of actually being able to, I always say, you know, we don't want women to be, uh, passive observers but active participants but we also need to be aware of the fact that with some of the more complex things here's the thing either the person has to give up you know a lot of other things in life to put all of their time into it which is exactly what you do as a as a uh, you know entrepreneur as you know or uh, they would have to start earlier you know and and that's why you know uh, educating young women from a early age is you know it, it's also yeah. very important and and the way we talk to them what you know the things that we get like i'm starting this new uh, youtube series on macroeconomy because i don't hear that many women talking about macroeconomy and I, you know i really want to get women into uh thinking about the world and uh, political philosophy macroeconomy you know like yeah. and technology all of these things my, my point on that would be i'm i'm getting more and more comfortable with you know, like, like a lot of women, I have a lot of imposter syndrome. 
and I don't have my PhD in, in quantum physics. And I'm getting more and more comfortable with that being okay. And of course, I'm, you know, going in the background and doing every, all the learning that I can. But I'm also, as an entrepreneur, getting more and more comfortable with hiring people that are smarter than me and kind of saying, you know, I don't necessarily know how this is going to look, but I trust you to, um, to, to be able to figure it out. Cause that's, you know, that's what you spent your life doing. Um, and yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. We should, we should get more women into this stuff earlier on and, and kind of eliminate the sort of, like I had a math fear growing up, you know, like math anxiety, um, get rid of that and, and get people into it. But I would say, you know, don't be afraid of, of just getting into it. Um, one of my, one of my best friends, uh, from childhood and we're still best friends is, uh, she started out her career. She didn't go to college. Um, she felt that she was not cut out for it. Um, she got her cosmetology license to, you know, do hair and, and nails and makeup. And then, you know, through a series of events, she kind of, she found a mentor who was a a rocket scientist at NASA. And this year she graduated college with her electrical engineering degree. And she turned down a job offer at NASA to be a rocket scientist, to take a job offer as a rocket scientist at another rocket company, um, which I think is just incredible. That's that's so cool. Yes, yeah. that's really cool. See, this is the kind of friends you need to be surrounding yourself with <laughs> is what, what you're doing which is, uh, yeah, exactly the right thing to do. Um, okay, so, yeah, I have, I still have um, so many questions and I'm just thinking about, okay, one thing I wanted to ask you about, who currently has quantum computer? Is it true that Google has it? So, good question. Uh, yes, so Google has a team that's working on building a quantum computer. And they, uh, again, it's a very early stage one, but I think in at the end of 2019, they announced quantum supremacy. So this was a huge deal. And what it meant was they used their quantum computer to solve a problem that would have taken the world's most powerful supercomputer uh, 10,000 years to solve. And I think they solved it in like three minutes with their quantum computer. So huge deal. It was the first time we were able to prove like in practice that a quantum computer could just demolish uh, or do something that was quote unquote intractable or not really possible with classical computers. And so that's super exciting. They're not the only ones. Um, I think, uh, so a lot of the big tech companies have quantum computer initiatives. So Microsoft, they're trying to there's a lot of different ways and theories about how to build a quantum computer. So Google's doing it one way. Microsoft is thinking about it a different way using like a different particle and architecture. They're building one, um, IBM, uh, <clears throat> even Honeywell, which usually you think of Honeywell, you think of thermostats, but they're, they're actually building a quantum computer. And then there's a number of kind of smaller startups that are, that are building quantum computers. So a company called Rigetti, um, a company called IonQ, uh, and they're all using different architectures to figure out how to scale this thing faster and faster. And then, of course, there's a lot of companies internationally um, outside of the U.S. That yeah, I was going to ask about China. So do you, yes. do you know what are they doing? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I actually know a, a, a recently that's been a lot of what we've been talking about is, is what China's been doing around it. Um, Publicly, China has spent about $15 billion on their quantum computing initiative. And they're, uh, they're working on being able to build a quantum computer. They've put a lot of faith and a lot of eggs in this basket, whereas you know, the US has spent about a billion to $2 billion. And then you know, the, the EU has spent some money and China by far has put the most into it. Um, and so it's they're a little more sort of secretive and they don't put things out there as much publicly. Very but worrying. It is, yeah, I've definitely from a cybersecurity pers perspective, right? Uh, so, you know, some of the work we do is with um, the, the government, the US government, and it's something that they are very concerned about. So if China, you know, gets that, that really powerful quantum computer first from a cybersecurity perspective, um, we need to be prepared for that. 
So yeah, they, it is a bit more secretive, the initiatives that they have going on in China. Um, they published a number of papers. I think they also had a, a quantum supremacy paper. But yes, it's definitely um, it's definitely a bit of a like interesting international competition right now. Uh, yeah. Really, really putting a concerted effort towards building that really powerful quantum computer. Yeah, super worrying. Yeah. So what do you think will happen to the future of jobs with this uh, quantum computing being, you know, like, because if, if computers can do everything better than us, you know, if, even if you think of like, what would be the ultimate role of humans would be just to go to the metaverse and play games, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, but computers could do that even, even that they could do it better than us. So mm -hmm. what, uh, what would be the role of, of humans? They could play games better than us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh man, it's you know when I um when I think about the ethical side of of things and it, when I think of AI ethics and technology ethics, it kind of kind of comes all down to that that same bucket of yeah when computers advance and we get um, artificial general intelligence and it's you know it can do a lot of things better than than humans. Where where are we at? Um, I I like to think of it more in terms of the the near term things that we can tackle. Um, Using, using computers and technology as tools to enhance uh, our ability to, I like to think of it in terms of being happy, because um, a lot of the times we forget about that as a, <laughs> as, as a human thing. Um, so in terms of you know, the, the very far future, I think it's interesting to think about some of the initiatives that are going on, like, for example, Elon Musk, uh, his neural link. So I think his, yeah, I'm his super idea, fascinated by that. Yeah. The neural super link. fascinating. Yeah. And I think his idea around this is, you know, you, you get around that problem by sort of Enhancing. integrating our brains with computers. And then, you know, we are the, <laughs> we have that capacity. It doesn't escape us sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I really don't know. Um, I think again, we gotta, we gotta do what we can on the ethical side and building things that, that take humans into account. But at a certain point we will, reach that that level of you know that that super intelligence line where um computers are very 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 smart i think you know right now we're at a place where we're we're not there yet um computers can do things certain things specific things way better than uh we can and there's so many things that humans can do better and you know part of me does think that that will always be the case that will, will all, there's always going to be a place for, for what we can do and what we can bring to it. Cause we are, um, we're really cool machines that, uh, that bring in color and life to, to, to machine processes. Um, but we are machines though. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, we, are, we are machines, we, right. And there is nothing to say. So, you know, I, I studied philosophy, uh, of political philosophy and philosophy of science and technology. And mm -hmm. I see myself as, you know, somebody who, yes, while I'm building a business and, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, but really the ultimate questions that I wake up every morning thinking about and go to bed thinking about and when I meditate and, you know, uh, the things that I'm super passionate about is exactly that question of what will happen to humanity and to what will be the next thing. And yeah. in uh, a lot of people don't like the uh, uh, the ultimate answer that I have to that. Um, and, you know, yesterday I was I was interviewing Laura Shin from uh, Unchained podcast and, and we were talking about this exact topic and I was like, you know, like I use the aura ring, you know, to measure how I still, yeah. yeah, exactly, you know, so, um, you know, and I was like, uh, I, I just, I'm, I'm super interested in the Neuralink. I, I, I really think like we are merging with technology. Like we are merging in my lifetime. We are going to be like merging with technology. It's going to happen. Right. And, uh, uh, and again, part of the, look, it's a personal choice. You know, people can have different, you know, uh, judgments of that. But part of the reason why I chose not to have kids, because I feel like I want to dedicate my life to focus on this, whatever is happening to capture it and to, uh, I call myself a transition architect and a tech philosopher, mm -hmm. you know, like a, you know, a, philo a really philosopher cool. of yeah. technology and, and a transition architect it would be, is somebody who uh, focuses like 
dedicates their life to making sure that this transition happens smoothly as we do this. And and it, uh, the goal of that is not necessarily it's not it's not about saving humanity because just like did do we, did we really want to not go from ape to human we you know it's great that we've gone from ape to human now we're going from human to superhuman or whatever that that next thing that's going to be and mm-hmm. my goal is to as a as a transitional architect is not to in any way to slow down or stop or speed up no just to minimize suffering and maximize happiness Love it. You know, yeah. that's what I think. Like, it's like, I feel like we are, as humans, we are here to create the maximum amount of great experiences, you know, like for, for the universe as a whole. And, you know, we talk about the uh, the Shoringa cat earlier, but he also talks about the, he's got this essay called What is Life, where he's like, where he's talking mm-hmm. about the, the entropy and, you know, how um, uh, random particles get together and, and create these constellations and and then they try to overcome entropy and that's that's basically life and for me like experiences like the experiences that we create are uh, in the cross-section of this entropy and order and um, and uh, every time you are um, evolving into something new you are going to go through kind of a growing pain essentially and and I think that if you are aware of it if if you go through that process in a way that you are conscious of the fact that you're going through this metamorphosis you become that becomes a beautiful experience and and you become part Mm -hmm. of it and you participate in it rather than being an active you know being a a, you know passive observer right like you know when, when you when we went from one of the beauties of going from ape to human is that we gained one level of consciousness that, you know, of, of self-awareness or self-consciousness, right? And now we have the ability to create a whole new beautiful experience because we are able to understand math, because we are able to understand, you know, uh, and yeah, you. like and, and yeah. to be able to imagine the whole of nature in your, you know, in, in your brain. So to me, this is like fascinating. And I'm, I'm, I really think, you know, I'm, I'm with Elon uh, on that because I think we really need to do that. But my yeah. goal is with Fempeak is to bring more women into thinking that way and, and to, um, you know, participate in it because technology is a one way street. It's not going to it's not going to slow down. It's not going to wait for us. <laughs> right, you know, right. so the best thing we can do is to. Um, to be honest, you know, as a as a philosopher, sometimes I even think technology is a life form in itself. You know, we we often think of technology as a set of tools and techniques that we use to enhance our lives. But who knows? Maybe technology is using us <laughs> to enhance itself. Interesting. <laughs> It's a bit like a like a parent child relationship, right? Yeah, I think that we are yeah. co-evolving. Here's the thing: I think that we are co-evolving with technology, and uh, if we don't scale together, at some point we are going to be left behind, mm. and there will be, you know, there will be other forms of beings <laughs> that will be generated with, um, and and there will be no trace of us. Mm. Right. And, 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 and the beauty of it would be if we could become part of this process. So we would, uh, you know, the, a trace of humanity would remain. Right, right. Well, and I think, you know, I, I, I love everything that you're saying. And I think part of the, to pick out the piece where you're talking about understanding the nature of things. Um, one of the cool things about where technology and science are going and, you know, and part of this is quantum computing as well. It will reveal more and more the nature of things. And, I think to be able to understand how to leverage and integrate with technology in, in a conscious way, we have to really understand what, um, you know, what it is to be a thinking thing, what it is to be a human, what, what humanity really is and how we, how we, uh, I guess, you know, how we optimize it in a sense, um, how we, how we become more, uh, better, fuller humans. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 one of the reasons why I'm interested in decentralization is, and for example, this new concept of the DAO, you know, the decentralized autonomous organizations, mm-hmm. is that 
may, and that may be a hope for us to be able to um, communicate about this new thing that we are becoming in a way that is more, uh, you know, possible uh, rather than, you know, allowing China and, and America and all of these, um, you know, state actors, and, um, you know, kind of like not allowing us to be part of that process, right? So, mm -hmm. so um, yeah, I think there's no better place to to stop uh, to uh, you know to to bring the conversation to an end so so yeah. um yeah awesome well i love it yeah well thank you so much for for your work and um and we've we've got such a big hill to climb in technology and and bringing more and more women into this space and and bring i guess just conscious development and thought and uh, and architecting into it and i love that and it's it's really 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 important work amazing thank you so much I appreciate your time. Cheers. This was definitely one of my favorite conversations and I lost track of time a little. Suddenly in the end, I realized that we were running out of time. So we wrapped up pretty quickly. We're definitely going to have Rebecca back on this podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider subscribing on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or any other one of your favorite podcast channels. And don't forget to give it a five-star rating and write a review. Finally, if you're not yet a member of Fempeak, head over to fempeak.ai, register and join to stay in the know and ahead of the curve.